Welcome out to the Trading Justice Podcast. Join with my brother, Matt. This is Mark, Justice Brothers. Uh, Matt, that was a week. <laughs> that was a week. Uh, we're going to do a pod here. Chaos and opportunity. A little bit of chaos. Will there be opportunity? Uh, we're going to break it all down. How are you doing, Matt? Uh, doing good. Excited to be here with another edition of the podcast. And yeah, you're right, Mark. It was uh, it was a real, <laughs> it was hell week. We've uh, That's how we described yeah. it at Tackle all week long. And you know, it was a big week, and uh, you know, it's. Uh, it, I think it's very important to talk about not only the week that was, but specifically what what we need to see in the future. You know yeah. what I mean? What 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 are the variables currently? What do we need to see in the future? Yeah, you know, and so yeah, it was uh, it was an interesting week, and I'm looking forward to uh, breaking it all down here in the podcast. Yeah, we're gonna try to break it down in 60 minutes. Now, Matt, you're a huge football fan, right? I am. Now I know that. I love football. You love football. We had a friend of ours on Friday ask, hey, did you catch part of the Hall of Fame game? And Matt and I both like look, looked at each other and like, w- 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 I mean, that's what kind of week it was in the market. We're not there yet. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, in fact, I, 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 I didn't know. <laughs> I love everything about football. And, uh, you know, I, I, I even have been catching up on some of the Dolphins. Yeah. Training but, camp and all that. But last week, Mark, when you think about it from a market perspective, an economic perspective, and all the just craziness from a political perspective, you put all three of those things together. The Hall of Fame game kind of, I kind of lost uh, track of it, honestly. All right. We got a little story for you and how we're going to tell this because there were a lot of moving parts last week. We're going to start with one of our favorite subjects, the Fed. Uh, the Fed met square in the middle of this week on Wednesday. Uh, and it was a very anticipated Fed meeting, right? We'd had inflation falling for months. Uh, you had just came off an inflationary reading three weeks before that set off the rotation trade. A lot of anticipation that the Fed would deliver a message of, you know, monetary policy, clear path of policy. And I don't think that's really what happened uh, this Wednesday. Uh, It was pretty much a chalk result. Uh, They left the rate unchanged. Uh, There was no surprise. I know there were people like myself who were like, hey, listen, it's not out of the woodwork. Uh, they said that, hey, listen, we got moderation in inflation, but we got stable economic growth. And this is really, and this is going to be an important point to discuss and understand about the market narrative. Not only the policy statement, but Jay Powell, when he came out 30 minutes later, came out and talked about how everything's just good, right? Very, like, Normalization was a uh, very uh, it was it was the drinking word of the day on on Wednesday. Normalization, he liked to say. And, and markets celebrated this general tone from Powell at at the start, where he was saying, "Hey, listen." And he kind of hinted, but he did not by any stretch saying we're cutting in September. He refused to do that. In fact, at one point, he said, "Hey, we might have zero cuts. We have, might might have multiple." He did not want to make a call of what was going to happen but there was a general tone that a cut is closer than it's been markets generally celebrated that but matt and and i know i've talked to you and i want to get your expanded thoughts on it after i say this like it was there was just this tone out of pal that there's not a problem in the world you know And, and it's not quite frat boy pal but it's it wasn't not frat boy pal either it was leslie nelson uh in front of the fire saying nothing to see here yeah it's like it's all good like 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 you know, Matt, I, give me your take i mean you are an avid fed watcher have been yeah. for a decade plus uh you eat drink and sleep this stuff what was your take on the fed meeting um i, th- I thought uh i thought jay powell was <sighs> I thought then I thought he was trying too hard to paint the labor market as normalization. And How many times frankly, did he say? The more times he said it, the more times I started thinking transitory. And and I just it, when you think about the Fed, I don't I don't have a lot of criticism for the Fed what they did or did not do this this past week in terms of the actual interest rate. Um, it, it's all about messaging when it comes out of the Fed. 
And so when you think back to transitory, you know, in early 2001, mid 2001, we started seeing early bumps up in inflation. Coming 2021. Tw yeah, 21. I know you have the uh, Japanese yen that we'll discuss on your mind. Uh, yeah, and, and on my mind as well. Which we'll discuss at the end of the uh, podcast. 2021, uh, when, when, the, when we were coming out of the pandemic and we were seeing the early signs of inflation, both Jay Powell and Janet Yellen, the Treasury Secretary, were were both on the uh, inflationist transitory bandwagon, and and they rolled that way too long uh, to the point where they overshot on that language, and they didn't take the inflationary situation seriously in the early stages where where they really could have done something to aggressively combat the inflationary uh, situation. That was about as obvious as as it could be out there when you're talking about the amount of money. That was going into the economic system throughout 2020 uh, 20 and 2021 in that year, year and a half after the pandemic began, it, it was obvious inflation was going to bump up. And I remember stating many, many, many times during that moment, Mark, they're, they're missing the beat here. Inflation is lagging, lagging, lagging. They're not taking into account the lagging nature of inflation. This thing is already building up. This thing is already ready to explode because of the, it, you could see it in the economic data. You could see it from a behavioral perspective. You just knew it from the amount of money that was coming into the system. And they were relying at that moment, Mark, on, on the pure, no, 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 no. It's not about the money that's coming into the system that's creating the inflation. It's the supply chain that's creating the inflation. And they were really, really, really stuck on that argument and, and to the point where they 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 missed the boat. And, and quite frankly, um, they were historically wrong on the transitory language, and they were they they misread the lagging part of the economic environment. They were making decisions based on data dependency, based on that data coming in right now. Data dependency, when you're talking about labor and inflation, which are historically lagging, is not exactly the best way, in my estimation. And so they were historically wrong on on transitory. And, and it set the stage for the next three years of of this monetary conversation. I have a feeling right now they're they're doing the same thing on the on the normalization of labor front, and uh, I am a little concerned on the on the labor side of the equation. Mark, he spent way too much time trying to message on the on the normalization of of labor. You and, picked and, up on this immediately, Matt. And oh, we I, were we were live I, in in the traders live lounge. in the traders lounge, and you're like, this is weird. It's, I mean, it, you didn't use that. You didn't say that term, but that weird, was. But I, but I that, said this is off. Yes, this is off. This, this is something's going on here. It, he's he's trying way too hard to paint the the bump up in 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 labor market and economic data as normalization. And I, in the back of my mind, Mark, I'm I'm thinking initial claims is coming in at two thirty two forty right now. That's that's not normal. Um, normals 200,000 on initial claims. Um, when you're talking about PMI numbers coming in in, in in contraction territory, but services numbers showing actually, you know, expansion, that's not normal. And so when, when he's trying his best to describe all of these concerns that people have on the economy right now as normal, it felt like it was a political messaging uh, tactic that that whenever the Fed embraces political messaging tactic, tactics, trying to gaslight the U.S. economy and the people, it, it's just it, it, I can see those things very. It, it, they just stand out to me. Mm -hmm. So I, I was concerned with the normalization of labor, but in that moment, Mark, when when we're sitting in the in the traders' lounge and we're watching the the price action regarding the 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 central bank, Chucky. It was a muted price response on, on the central bank. It, it was it wasn't even it wasn't even volatile on on the 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 press release when it came out and said you know no, what, not not was, by uh, Fed standards yeah oh, not by Fed standards in any capacity, and and it just kind of hovered there. But there was that concern coming into the Fed that we're not just giving up a little bit of the uh, of the labor market, we're giving up a lot of the labor market. And so when you look at initial claims coming into the Fed mark, you were starting to see a bump up in initial claims literally within uh, within the last three, four uh, data points. 
When you're looking at the labor market, for example, we're looking at the labor market right here. What do we see from, Mark, this is year to date. We went from 3.7 to 4.3% uh, on, the, on the labor market year to date. That is up, 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 up. Almost every single month sans one, we have seen a bump up in uh, the labor market year to date. When you're looking at initial claims, look at the trends of initial claims. Over the course of the last two months, you've seen a steady rise from about that 210,000 up to north of 230,000 when it comes to initial claims. So for example, July 3rd came in at 238, July 11th came in at 222, July 18th came in at 243, July, two, uh, July 25th, 235. Now he didn't have the August number, but when he made the statement of- Jay Powell had the August number. There's I think no way, too. well, there's no way the- the chairman but, but of the park. Everybody knows two hundred thousand is kind of the number on initial claims. Why is he trying to state that two hundred and forty two hundred yeah. fifty thousand is normalizing? It's the same concept of when they try to shift the inflationary scale to normalizing at two percent, two point five percent, three percent. It's it's not normal, and we have to call that out. All and right. so when, when he was just stuck on the normalization of labor, when we're seeing bumps up year to date on, on labor and we're seeing bumps up over the course of the last couple months on labor, it's one of those concerning data points. And so the market is slightly concerned coming into the Fed just from a labor market perspective. And then when you look at from from you know, an economic perspective, we started seeing some economic data such as PMI manufacturing. All right, let's let, let, let's come back to the Fed. We'll get to that here in a second. We'll come yeah. get back here in a second. So, look, okay. Now, one of the jobs, and, and you read this in memoirs of like, uh, you know, you know, people in charge of the Fed previously, that they feel like it's their job to make sure that uh, uh, to exude confidence, right? Even if the data should not, right? You know, they downplay bad news in order to exude yeah, because there's obviously a self-fulfilling prophecy to all of this and and yeah i don't blame them for trying to 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 put confidence out there it, but confidence isn't trying to gaslight normalization of labor market and especially in the yeah. i'm not even talking about the context of labor i'm not even talking about how, how people in America right now have to get 1.5 to 2 jobs just to offset the inflationary scale over the last two years. I'm just talking about the actual raw numbers. There's nothing normal about the raw numbers. When you add the context of what's going on in labor, I, I'm sorry, it, trying to paint labor as normal when over the last three years, the majority of, of jobs have have not been full-time jobs, have not been domestic jobs, have not been jobs that stick long-term. It's been a, a, a tremendous amount of part-time, a tremendous amount of seasonal, a tremendous amount of secondary, a tremendous amount of immigration. And now you're trying to say all of that is normal. All of that is a normal labor market and initial claims mm -hmm. is now normal. And, and, and I'm just sorry, there's nothing normal about that. And he tried way too hard to paint that normalization comment. And so, I, I, again, when you're thinking about what you just said, it's the Fed's job, part of their job to, to display confidence. And Jay Powell did that a little bit on Wednesday, and that's why the market held up, right? He's like, hey, we're not cutting right now, but you know, we're probably going to cut in September. We're still going to be data dependent in that. But then he just stuck on the labor market is normalizing. Labor market is normalizing. Labor market is normalizing. And it set the stage. And it set the stage. And, and, and all right, the entire so. market is now on pins and needles regarding labor is normalizing. And then you get an initial claims report that comes in on Thursday at 249 versus. All right. So, 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 okay. So, so labor market on Friday. That was. You're all fired up. I got to rein you in. I got to rein you in. <laughs> All right. All right. So this is an important thing. And, and this is a point where you're going to want to remember in your tactical plans and for weeks and months to potentially come. Jay Powell trying to normalize the labor market and that everything is OK. Then Thursday morning comes. Right. And we get a batch of economic data. Uh, markets on a little bit of sugar high. You had Tom Lee out there talking about how the S&P is going to go up five percent in the next five days. Um, you know, it's like, touch are coming, everything's great. The economy's great. Leslie Nielsen, nothing to see here. 
And then economic data starts coming in on Thursday morning. It started with unemployment claims, Matt, and this was the highest number, I believe, in over a year, right, at 249. So you had everything's good, and then you have an economic data point come out that is, all right, so let me rephrase this. How's everything's good? We're not going to cut for a while. Everything's then, normal. Everything's normal. Don't worry about it. It's nothing to see here by pals walking and down the Then you get an team. economic data yeah. point at 8.30 a.m. Eastern, an hour before the market opens, one of the worst in a year. That was followed 75 minutes later by an ISM manufacturing PMI number that was about the worst in over a year, deep into contraction territory. And all of a sudden... The market collectively was like, bad news is bad news. And the market doesn't speak with the voice. Maybe one day AI will be the market and it will speak with the voice. But there was almost like this collective sense that house full of crap. The Fed is out of touch. Bad news is bad news. The Fed might be behind the eight ball. Um, it's it, it happens a lot, Mark. It, it not not this type of volatility and the timing of this was interesting, but it does happen a lot where the market gets concerned over something. If if you'll remember in in January of this year, we all got concerns on the double dip inflationary situation when we saw some some inflationary data that came in that was that was quite aggressively on the on the beat side on the top side. And that brought in a little bit of concern on the double dip. We talked about it here in the podcast. We literally did a podcast called Inflationary Gaslighting, Double Dip Inflation, because of the concern of the data that was at that at that moment in time. Well, Mark, if if how that if if how gives a if, if we're all concerned about inflation, and in March of this year, just hypothetically, Pal comes out and says, inflation's nothing to see here. It's all great, guys. Don't even worry about it. And then the very next day, we get the hottest read of inflation in the market. The market participants who are already concerned about inflation coming into it, and all of a sudden, it's just a reminder to everybody simultaneously, right? And and that kind of happened this week where Pal's talking about the normalization. Mark, there was concern coming into the Fed that the Fed was overshooting on the economic conversation, it, meaning they were they were being a little bit too stubborn on the pausing. And they they probably, the concern was they probably should embrace a, a cutting cycle sooner than later so they don't overshoot on the economy the same way they overshoot, uh, overshot on the inflationary conversation. That was already in the market coming into it. On top of that, there was already massive concern on the slowing growth out of big cap tech from an earnings perspective. So you had some degree of concern coming in. And I'm not talking about every market participant. I'm talking about some market participants out there that the economy was slowing it more aggressively than the Fed was stating. And that, and from an earnings perspective, we were seeing slowing growth out of big cap tech that was bigger than what was expected. And that concern was live in the market going into Wednesday. And then Powell decides the messaging on Wednesday is going to be nope, nope, nope. Let's let's not talk about anything on the concerning side. Everything's going to be just based on normalization. That's fine. How comes out? He's the leader. He's the catalyst. He's the guy that people anchor against. And he's saying nothing to see here. So the market on Wednesday says nothing to see here. But then on Thursday morning, you get the double dip of initial claims. And, and, and the, the kind of ghost of William Dudley from the week before, former Fed um, pr uh, president who had spooked the market just one week earlier. Uh, uh, vice president out of uh, Dudley, like second in command, William Dudley for years. Who, who had said the Fed should cut in July and specifically citing labor saying they're behind the curve. This is going to end badly. If they don't, they don't cut in July. How confident but then, Matt, on Thursday morning, Friday, you get unemployment data, ghost of William Dudley, these concerns, and a mounting concern that the Fed is just... Well, and, and again, it's it's tough timing for Powell, normalization, 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 and then the next three data points are all some of the worst data points economically we've had year to date. And so... You go from a normalization in the market on Wednesday 
to a, oh my goodness, we're staring down the barrel at three of the worst economic data points we've had year to date, two on the labor side of it and one on the ISM manufacturing side. And the simple reality, Mark, that that triggered a sell first, ask questions later moment, where it's like, I, I, is the Fed behind the eight ball or are they wrong on on you know, uh, normalization the same way they were they were wrong on transitory, for example. And that's when you saw the market recalibrate. And and what I mean by recalibration is the in, all indexes started running on the exact same gasoline. Bad news was bad news for IWM, for the uh, for the Qs, for the spiders, for RSP. Hey, remember when people yeah. complained that the market wasn't correlated? Listen, I, I said <laughs> last week that-, that Ah, it's not correlated. You got some- uh, uh. I said last week, we're closer to recalibration. I just didn't know the path. It was you know, gonna... And what's funny about Matt, in an alternate universe, the Fed cuts, maybe the economic data is not so bad. And you break out of that 20 period moving average, right? Like, you know, th this, th this wasn't foreseen that it had to play out like this. Uh, but no, it, no, if, if, if Powell does not do the, if Mark, you can talk about the economic data being the trigger here. I, I don't, mean, you think well, about this, I Matt. don't think it was, I want to be clear on something. Mm -hmm. I do not believe the economic data is the reason we sold off. I believe it was Powell setting the stage yep, for absolutely a hundred percent in the entire market. And this like, is oh, an important is point. Fine. Yeah, this is an important point oh. to understand about what comes next. And we'll talk about this here in a second. Al's messaging on Wednesday was horrific. I cannot describe how terrible the concept of normalizing the labor market was right in front of two, three data points that Which remind he had everybody to have had. about how unnormal the labor market currently and, and, is. And Matt, you know, I just want to bring up one question, and this is concerning to me as a U.S. citizen. Uh, and I talked about this to you the other night. I'm like, because that was a unanimous decision. Mm -hmm. Like, and, and the Fed, like how, in the, it was a reasonable day. There's William Dudley out there talking. There were reasonable people. How is it a unanimous said had, decision? How said they had a good debate. On, uh, but how does it come down to unanimous decision amongst all of these? Like the Bank of England, when they have their decision, it was a 5-4 vote, right? Mm -hmm. What's up? It, it makes me suspicious. I'm like, is it like you're all just like, it doesn't make any sense to me that you would have a unanimous decision on a what would could be a very reasonable conversation. Um, the vote was 13-0. Uh, the bank, uh, the vote at the Bank of uh, you can't get thirteen Chicago. Americans to agree on anything. <laughs> no, you cannot. No, you cannot. And, and there are left leaning people. Is it? A, is the sky it. blue? I don't know. Here's, I, I'm just going to be as as transparent as possible on this on this answer because I think it's a very simple thing to understand. The the Fed. The Fed gaslights America nonstop on two issues. Number one, we care about you. And number two, um, regarding we do not take politics into account in our monetary decisions. I, I, I've never believed either one of those. And I think it's foolish for anybody to think that the Fed, who is ran by human beings, does not take into account politics in any capacity regarding their messaging and their decisions that come out of the central bank. It is absolutely ridiculous to, to make the statement that we do not take politics into account. And in a moment where there is viable debate on the economic side, on the monetary side and the inflationary side to state that you have unanimous consent at 13 zero on the vote without taking into account politics. And so for me, absolutely do I believe that politics was taken into account, meaning the election season, on this specific decision and the messaging that is coming out of the central bank. They wanted a 13 nothing vote so that they could be crystal clear on the messaging side of the equation. I, I personally do not believe that's how it should work. I personally believe the, the, uh, the Bank of London, 5-4, having good debate, discussion, debate, disagreement is perfectly fine. The central bank obviously disagrees because they have to come across as they're perfect and they're not. Yeah, no, listen. So I think we've set the stage of what occurred into what was a very violent two days in the market. Uh, let's look at some technical charts, Matt, here. Uh, I mean, it, it, I mean, 
the violence, you know, as a individual who is a cash flow trader, right? I deal with puts, I deal with various option things. This was a really rough two day stretch for someone like me as we I saw volatility explosions on a level I have not seen. I didn't see it in 2022, Matt. Mm -hmm. I did not see the type of craziness in the volatility market in the entire bear market in 2022. I have to go back to 2020 to, I had to pull out that playbook uh, to deal with it on, on, on that level. Uh, we saw a pretty violent price action in lots of areas of the market. That's a candle to remember, right? And that, and it, that ended at 23, man, it got up to 30. <laughs> like, like the rate of change here. Uh, pretty dramatic. Matt, break down the technicals for us. Let's like go through, um, you know, and just give us your, you know, your expert technical read on, you know, just basically every area of the market right now. Yeah. And, and here's the thing about the macro side of it right now. It's all mixed. The Fed's mixed. The economic side of it is mixed. The geopolitical geopolit side of it is mixed. I will say out of all the macro analysis that that you and I do, the one thing that I'm not as mixed on is the earnings side of the equation. Yeah, and we'll get to that later. And, Absolutely. And we'll get to that. And that's that's important as well because earnings is a forgotten child right now in the marketplace. When the market is all united on the macro side of the equation. <laughs> Apple had earnings and nobody wanted to talk about it. Nobody wanted to talk about it. Like nobody wanted it. Amazon and Apple. It, it, it like, hey, get, out of, get out of here. I'll, we'll, we'll deal with that later. What about J-Pal? Right. Um, but, but we saw sizable shifts in volatility last week. There is no doubt about that, Mark. And it it it, it was a oh, it happened wild, fast too, man. Wild ride. You look at uh, you look at it on a daily chart and you see the VIX just go from and I don't look at the VIX very often, but it is symbolic to help you understand kind of the type of volatility we are seeing in the marketplace. And we're seeing pretty sizable shifts in volatility right now. Now, do I think this volatility is going to continue? I think that's I think that's the open question. If I had the answer to it, I think we would all, you know, yeah, put, be putting in market orders I, for I, Monday. I, I do have a strong opinion on. I, on the I have an opinion as well, and I'm sure we'll uh, we'll snuff that out as we get through the analysis here. When you are looking at at some of these charts out there, the VIX, the you know, uh, the uh, S and P 500, and I do think now that we're through the Fed. And now that we're through most of earnings season, Mark, especially the big couple weeks of earnings season, which is in the the rearview mirror at this point, I do believe we start we start navigating this from a from a technical perspective far more than anything else out there. And when you are looking at the VIX, the the VIX has spiked in in the last couple of years. We've seen these moments in time. We had one just recently in April. We had one last October as well. The VIX spikes, it spikes, and it comes back down. It spikes, it comes back down. Now, the VIX did get above that 200-day moving average, which had been acting as a little bit of resistance. We are seeing a little bit more volatility than the one we saw in April, the one we saw even uh, even last October. But the ultimate question to volatility is, is where does the bottoms come in, in in that situation? And you're not going to be able to look at that from a VIX perspective, trying to understand where the bottom is happening in the marketplace itself. And that's where the, the name of the podcast, I think, is important this week. You know, when you're talking about the, the chaos in the market, the chaos in the market is, is really simple to understand. The, the market had some concern. The Fed said, don't worry about that concern. And then we got data points that told us to be really concerned about what the Fed told us not to be concerned about. That is the simple way to describe what happened in the market last week. A lot of volatility. But Mark, that does that it, does that ultimately lead to that volatility continuing in the market? I'm not sure about that. And, and so there's obviously some open questions there. But I do believe this is an opportunity as well. So the chaos is in the last couple of weeks. Where does the opportunity uh, emerge? I think we're going to have to be a little bit patient here. Yeah. And I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing because we're going to be dealing, dealing with bottoming prices here in some capacity. And I do think when you're working on bottoming analysis, you can be a little bit more patient than when you're working on a momentum breakout. In a momentum breakout, you got to giddy up and go. You got to make a decision on that breakout, whether you want to do something about it. When you're going through depth of the retracement, pullback language, why the, uh, either that's on a daily chart or a weekly chart, 
you can be a little bit more patient in, in retracement analysis. And so when you are looking at the market this week, realize the most important time frame on the market right now is the weekly chart. When you're looking at the S&P 500, you got the S&P 500 right at the 20 period weekly moving average, which was the exact same point where we saw the bottoming formation happen the last time we went through this saga. Now it's not guaranteed for the 20 to hold, but that is the last time we did test this technical level on that correction, and it did hold against that 20 period moving average. Now, Mark, that's what we're looking at to occur here. But is that a given? Is that a guarantee? We we don't know. We gotta we gotta work through that data. And so you're looking at those major catalysts on the weekly chart, and you're saying, okay, we're at a weekly support level. It certainly could play out as 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 support again. But you got to work that out from a daily chart perspective. And so the last time we went through this, Mark, on the weekly chart where it came down to the 20 period weekly moving average, bro, I'm going to tell you right now, I know the conversation right now is very sensitive economically, very sensitive to the labor condition, very sensitive uh, to the PMIs, very sensitive to the, to the messaging misstep out of the central bank this week. But you know what, bro, if you go back just four months ago, three, four months ago, Rinse and repeat that same concern. Anytime the market starts showing selling behavior, we're gonna we're gonna try to describe that. I'm not saying you and I. I'm saying market participants. They're gonna uh, they're gonna get concerned. They're gonna uh, they're gonna describe that as is this the big one? And Mark, how many times the last time we did this did we go through that conversation? Is this a market correction or is this something else? And the whole time we're like, no, it's just gonna, it's just a market correction. It's just a market correction. Well, right now, isn't that how you have to see it? It is just a market correction until something else transpires. And if you violate the 20 period moving average on the weekly chart, that is an indication that there is something else playing out. And so what do we want to see here this week? We want to see a week where we don't get a lot of economic data. We don't get that this week. We certainly don't get the earnings uh, types names this week that we got last week. Last week, it was all Apple, Meta. It was Microsoft. It was all those big dog stocks out there, right? Well, this week, the biggest stock out there is Berkshire. Uh, Eli Lilly, a massively important company. But I want to say Berkshire and Eli Lilly is, has the same market uh, movement ability as Apple, Microsoft, and, and, and Meta, for example. And so you get a little bit of, uh, of a reprieve on the type of names and the amount of names that is coming in from an earnings perspective. And you also look at an economic environment next week where, quite frankly, there's just not a lot economically next week. Uh, when you are looking at the economic calendar, uh, for example, when I'm looking at next week, Oh, it's not the Australian I want to look at. Let's go and look at a whole bunch of the central banks and just look at the United States dollar. Um, Mark, we get services PMI numbers and initial claims next week. That's it. And, and just just an interesting note, because I know I have this prepped. It hap the services data, economic data, very sensitive, happens 30 minutes after the market opens. Something to be aware of just um, if you're placing trades or whatever on Monday morning. Well, and services PMI usually doesn't have the impact that and, and Matt, you and I joked the other night talking to each other. When we are talking PMI numbers and having to tactically navigate around, this isn't a good thing for the market. Uh, when we're talking <laughs> PMI numbers, usually the market is having a sensitive economic conversation. That's certainly the case. Because right nobody now. cares about PMI numbers <laughs> unless they're like, oh my gosh, what's going they on? Don't. They don't. They are secondary in general. Um, but my point is this. We're going into a, a we, we've came through a stretch in the market the last two weeks. Tremendous amount of information coming into the market. This week was legitimately hell week. And, and I think that is a proper way to describe the, uh, the price action and the type of news that came into the market this week. But what about what next? That, that's equally as important here because, yes, we have concern in the market, but you don't get opportunities at the low point unless there is concern in the market. If there is no concern in the market, there's no blood in the streets, which means you can't pick up great stocks at quality prices. Everybody in their dog was complaining about valuation just three weeks ago. Well, valuation is going to get better because earnings is going up and price is going down. And so what next? To me, what next starts this week? And what I think is extremely important this week 
is for the market to start digesting this in terms of not selling. We don't need the market to gobble up this week. We don't need the market to to just start buy, buy, buy and V-shape recovery here this week. If you V-shape recovery after the economic conversation from last week. I I will be fading that. Let me finish. The only person that's going to be able to take advantage of that is algorithms and hedge funds. That's it. And so you want to see this market get digested. And the last time we went through this, it took a good week and a half, two weeks for the market to stabilize at that low point. And then you had that upward movement in price confirming that. And I talked about this, Chucky, in the newsletter this previous weekend. And if you are not reading the newsletter every single week, you are missing the boat here. That This newsletter will help you understand every aspect of the market this week, what we need to see coming into the market next week for us to start working out a little bit of confidence. And what I talked about is talking about that weekly pullback and the type of data we need to see on that weekly pullback uh, as we navigate it on the daily to start getting more confidence. And for me, Mark, you got to have this start to get consolidation. We want to see short-term consolidation here. That will alleviate some of the volatility of the recent price action. And then as we start to get a little bit more time, the market moves away from the conversation. And then all of a sudden, you start talking about the earnings backdrop instead of the economic backdrop. And so to me, patience plays here. Let's let the bottoming formations play out at the at the 20 period moving average. And if the 20 period moving average does not hold, well, unless you're market ordering here, we're not at tackle trading. We need to see a, we need to see a daily reversal here in my estimation. And that's going to be a beautiful opportunity to pick up. But again, it starts with consolidation on the daily chart. Yeah, I mean, I know for me personally, any V-shaped type recovery, I will treat as a bearish retracement, reduce exposures, be aggressive with covered calls. Uh, uh, even, like, if it's the same energy, yeah, like, like yeah, absolutely. If it's the if, same. Now, if you come off a foundation, this market is very cooperative. You go back over the last five, six, seven years, these six, seven, two week consolidation support builds those have been the winning formula for bottoming uh, formations. And so, um, like, you know, give us that and get aggressive. Uh, So so if you get something like this, like that, like if you see anything along those lines, you reduce. You 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 just reduce. Because that's just algorithms at play on the low and it, that might be sh- short sellers quick i mean who knows right yeah you know you uh, give me something like we had in april and i don't care if it happens here i don't care if it happens lower i don't care where it happens to be honest if you give me something like april uh, i'm going to be very very interested in that you know, yeah you that, give me you give me that next week you know, uh, you know and it doesn't have to be that that clean but yes that would be pretty you get my point though yes i get your general point matt uh we fire through uh the other areas of the market i know i have a uh bias towards technology coming up uh as far as the ways this can play out right uh you know and we'll do this in a future podcast uh but i will be open minded towards any area of the market that shows bottoming formations under pressure first. I'll let the market tell me what it thinks first. Listen, the rotation trade is currently dead, which means, and the markets are currently running on the same gasoline, which means the market is going to go through a technical reset here. And as the market is going through a technical reset here, I don't know about you, Chucky, but I'm not going to be looking at small and mid caps still fighting the top end of pricing versus the uh, versus the uh, technology areas of the market that is currently sitting at the 200 day moving average. Yeah, call me old fashioned. Yeah, shocking, right? We we like 200 day moving averages, and so you got technology at the 200 day moving average. You got to work it out. We we don't we don't we don't buy dips the same Matt, way. XLK is almost giving up all of its gains for the year. Like yeah. it's like, like, you know, if you missed out if from a whatever and you, this is where you start looking. <laughs> and, and mind you, mega cap tech, they just didn't raise guidance. That's it. Like they all came in with beats, but they just didn't raise guidance. And that's kind of a change over the last six, uh, six quarters. But mega cap tech sitting at the 200 day moving, not mega cap, but tech in general sitting at the 200 day moving average. And 
in my estimation at this point with the market running on the same gasoline. I do think, you know, aggressive areas of the market will probably be looked at a little bit more keenly than cyclical uh, than cyclical areas of the market. And so kind of that's the debate right now because the market's running on the same gasoline is cyclical versus aggressive right now. And I do think because aggressive kind of led that charge to the downside is probably going to lead the charge back up to the top side. The the question right now is is not is not really aggressive or cyclical because they're all going through volatility right now. The question is how long can defensive maintain a bid here? Mm. And and so you got defensive areas of the market that are doing its traditional defensive job. And typically when we're having a pure economic concerning conversation, defensive areas of the market will shine brighter than the aggressive and the and the and the cyclical areas of the market. And so we are seeing that play out in general. So last week it was sell cyclical, sell aggressive. And and where are we going to hide for last week? We're going to hide a little bit in 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 defensive. That was kind of the the name of the game last week. When you look at you can kind of see it fairly decent when we're talking about the rankings at tackle trading that we put into the newsletter every uh, every single week as well, you can kind of see how we had fairly large downgrades in the aggressive areas of the mar- market, fairly large downgrades in the cyclical areas of the market. But to offset that, the defensive nature, the defensive areas of the market actually had a pretty good week. When you look at it on the heat map, for example, and you're looking at one week performance, you see it's not all red out there last week, Mark. In fact, even in some of these cyclical areas of the market, it wasn't all red last week. You just had some stocks report earnings that that kind of took over the overall price action. But it was a mix of green and red last week in, in, in the marketplace. It was really the aggressive and and some of the cyclical areas that did really bad. Utilities had a standout week. Uh, Every earnings that came out was gobbled up by the market. We were dealing with a lot of beats on on the earnings side in in utilities. Real estate had a really good week. Interest rate bearing markets had a really good week. Uh, Consumer defensive stocks had a pretty decent week last week. And so the last week performance was not very bad. In the last month, you obviously see the cyclical side and the defensive side playing out a lot better than the aggressive side. My point is, over the last four weeks, five weeks, six weeks, the cyclical and defensive have done fairly decent. Again, the last two days notwithstanding, it is the aggressive areas of the market that have been trending to the downside for the last three, four weeks, not just the last two, three days. And so you're going to, once this market bottoms out, Mark, you're, you're, you're most likely going to want to look at the stocks that have been selling a little bit more aggressively in that previous uh, previous time frame. And so, you know, from a sector perspective, you like the defensive sectors a little bit right now. It's a, it, it is a place to hide during this volatility. But as this volatility subsides, Mark, I, I, I for me, I think it's going to be big cap tech that I look at the the most. It's it, and probably secondarily will be communications uh, and a little bit of discretionary as as we see bottoming formations. What about you? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I'm I'm just never one like oh, let me go see where I can hide for a little bit. I'm more looking for constant things that I can get involved with. Uh, well, and you, you know. know I, you and I and other traders will just go cash and we'll aggressively. Yeah, I, I don't, I'm not a hider. Like, I'm not, because I'm not managing somebody's money, man. I'm managing yeah, my money. Mutual funds right? have to. Mutual funds like, oh, let's go to. hide and because because we can't just be sitting in 70% cash. So, yeah. Uh, you know, which is understandable. No, it's technology. It's technology for me. Uh, we fire through some uh, commodity charts, Matt, uh, because while some areas of the uh, complex got caught up in uh, some of the volatility on the economic concerns, oil primarily, which is coming down, you know, you know, and I wrote in the newsletter, Matt, can't go bullish, can't go bearish because risk reward doesn't make sense. Check in next week. Is that a pretty good summary uh, of oil? I don't have much to say other than that. I mean, I have zero interest in crude oil. Well, they just can't do anything with um, it right now. And even yeah. on the energy side, I like I I have very little interest right now on energy either. I had a lot of interest on energy over the course of the last month. 
And this uh, could play out really nicely, but you got to let it play out. Listen, like, it, however it plays out. I don't know. I don't know how it plays out. Yeah. And you're not going to push the chips into the middle of the table when you don't have an edge. So if you don't have an edge, like stay away. And that's how mm -hmm. I see energy. There's just too much volatility there. And there's too much geopolitical situations happening right now. And, and so crude oil, is crude oil going to run on the geopolitical theme? Is it going to run on the concern on the economic theme? I'm not even sure the geopolitical theme even though it's a, it's an escalation type conversation in the Middle East right now, I'm not even sure it's going to have an economic impact, quite frankly. Um, what I do know will have an economic impact on crude oil is uh, uh, synchronized global slowing growth. That would have a massive impact on the demand equation of crude oil. So I, I think you got some concern here on crude oil. It has not been uh, behaving very well from a technical or a fundamental perspective ever since Saudi Arabia basically pulled off the uh, the rug from I got your back analysis. It had a B-shape down, B-shape up, B-shape down. It's been all over the board and it's been very difficult to read. It's a stay away from me right now until we see better data, quite frankly. Off, uh, uh, to move on from the crude oil side of the equation, I think silver is a, is another one of those stay aways right now in the short term, given the fact that it's got a complex picture uh, from a technical and a fundamental pr uh, perspective right now. You haven't seen too much selling. You haven't seen enough selling. I know that's weird, but you haven't seen enough selling to start getting into a bottoming formation type conversation. And you haven't, and, and you got too much chop to the left to really concern yourself with any type of breakout. So it, it silver's a little bit of a stay away right now. On the gold front, it's another day that ends in why we love gold and gold's fighting another multiple time frame breakout. Most likely needs to get dialed in with a high base, but keep an eye on that 2500 zone when it comes to gold. I will tell you the one uh, the one that does uh, uh, pique my interest a little bit, I don't like the volatility over the last three days, but I don't like the volatility in anything over the last three days, uh, is copper here. And, and the one commodity that I feel like we could be getting into some degree of bottoming formation uh, is, is is copper. You're, you're working off that 200-day moving average over the course of the last week, week and a half. You probably would want, and I don't even want to say probably, you, 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 do, you will want to see another week of consolidation here. Another week of consolidation will short that $4, uh, $4 uh, support level up very well. But what it will also do is get that 20-period moving average, which is at 430 right now, it'll get it down to 420. And that, to me, would be a really good backdrop. Another week of consolidation, you know, building that support level off that $4, you know, level off that 200-day moving average, get that 20-period moving average to converge against the breakout channel, and that will look pretty good. And I know there's quite a bit of people at Tackle that are looking at a potential FCX, for example, getting caught up in a lot of the technical conversation over the course of the last couple of days. If if copper does what I think it's going to do, well, then this little downward pressure in price we saw over the last couple of days on a company like FCX, I think would get gobbled up pretty. Oh, if if, if copper doesn't move, the second broad market volatility ends FCX floors. I yeah, I, 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 I mean we've seen that. this. We've seen this because it's. I mean we've seen this with gold mining stocks a million times. Oh my gosh, the markets sell off gold mining even though gold doesn't do anything, and then they floors. So. Yeah. And, you know, it, 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 depending on what when that occurred and what price point, you might like SCCO a little bit better than FCX. I'm going to like FCX better because I always like FCX better. But um, I, I, I do think the one two punch of waiting for copper to base and then give us a breakout with confirmation and then looking at whatever your copper proxy is. I think that, right. that that's that's certainly on my mind. I got to move on. Give me the uh, SPY again or the S&P 500 futures. I want to spend two minutes on this. The biggest concern I have coming up is that the market sensing Fed weakness in messaging does a classic, let's punish things until the Fed gives us what we want. We've seen oh. this throughout history. 2018, baby. We've seen this throughout history. 2018, at the end of 2018, was a classic, 100%. Had nothing to do with anything other than let's make Jay Powell bend the knee. That's what November and December of 2018 were all about. Uh, and you know what Jay Powell did? He bent the knee. <laughs> he didn't bend the knee until the 200 weekly. Yeah, but, but that's the concern because Jay Powell is a stubborn man. 
We've seen that when he digs into something, whether it's 2018 or inflation is transitory. And Matt, he just got going on the labor market is normalizing. He just getting going on this one. How much pressure could the market exert? Now, economic data is probably going to play a large role in that, right? If economic data comes in decent, that's going to remove kind of the, the catalyst behind well, it. If you remember right, Powell was trying to do something right. I, mm-hmm. And I want to be clear on that. Powell was trying to normalize rates in, in 18. That's what he was trying to do. He was going to raise rates. He was going to normalize rates. And it did not occur in December of that year. The plunge protection team led by Steve Mnuchin, obviously Jay Powell, they made a decision to radically adjust. And and after that, markets were up, 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 up. I just want to ask everybody a question. What, what would have occurred during the pandemic if Powell would have normalized rates in 18? Instead of starting all of that trillions and trillions of trillions of dollars in stimulus, you don't do that. You cut rates and then you go to quantitative easing. But he didn't do that because he gave up the fight. And and I, I think that was his first mistake, quite frankly. And I think that was the moment Jay Powell should have stopped being the central bank president of the United States is in December of 2018 when he capitulated to political pressure to 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 lower interest rates and to embrace quantitative easing. And that historically does not get the conversation it should because historically looking back if we would have normalized rates in 2018 and 2019 going into the pandemic of 2020 none of us would be dealing with the inflationary saga today if Powell would have adjusted interest rates in 2018 it would have been a completely different saga one thousand percent different environment that was his first historical mistake and he should have been fired literally right then. He compounded that with transitory. And, and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna blame him for what, what they did during the pandemic. That was crazy. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna blame him for the pandemic. I will blame him for 2018. I will blame him for transitory and I will blame him for normalization, but I'm not gonna blame him for the pandemic because that was an that was an a very, very I, it, it, I, you, it's hard. I, it, it, it's it, it, environment. It, overkill the situation, and you. Oh yeah, maybe we overkilled too much, right? It, it, but so the right. question I have, Mark, though, because we know that saga, that saga was a two and a half month saga of constant downward pressure in price, where the market didn't just go through correction; it was going through perhaps a bear market, and you were all the way down around the two hundred day moving average. Now it, it finished there because we had that. No, the 200 week. Yeah, yeah, 200 weekly. But again, that last 10% was like one day, right? It was really fast. Yeah, it was really fast. But it did take about two months initially. Mark, Powell has historically been really, really slow to act on anything, on anything. By the way, you know, Volcker, never, never slow to act on anything. Never slow to act on anything. Powell's very slow to act on anything. I've been hearing chatter that the market is trying to force Powell's hand. What's your thoughts on that? This is my worry. Uh, My worry is not earnings, which we'll talk about just here briefly. Uh, My worry isn't even the economy, right? Because I think you and I are both in the stagnation camp, right? Mm -hmm. Which, you know, companies, individual companies can outperform that, right? Uh, My worry is, is the Fed. And the Fed that the the market has lost confidence in this Fed uh, because one might argue they've never really had confidence in Powell. The market Um, ever since transitory has bullied Powell, Mark. Yeah. And and so Powell comes out with that message. And Matt, it's not just the Twitter verse and Joe Blow. It's respected voices like Mohammed El Arin, uh, who I respect immensely, who's basically said, Powell, you screwed up. You're du- this is bad. You, I mean, and, and William Dudley last week, Muhammad no, Ali, this like, the screw up to me. They're talking about the screw up being not lowering interest rates. The screw up to me was not that. It's the it, messaging part. That that's the, it, we don't have the. And, and I think you are right, Matt, because if you if you say 
hey, everything's good. And then all of a sudden the economic data gets shaky. People are like, oh, you have no idea what you're talking about. This is way too confident on the normalization. Right? Not quite frat boy, but not not right. frat boy. It, normalization is now on the tombstone. So like, yeah. And so this is going to require me to get a good old fashioned, uh, you know, I might do some bottom dipping in commodities because I'm going to treat commodities generally like I treat commodities, you know, always. I'm going to treat Bitcoin like I treat Bitcoin always. I might get a price on an individual stock where I'm like, well, that's just stupid. I'm going to give up. But generally outside of those normal operations and piddling, I'm a, I am need a bottoming formation to get actively involved yeah. uh, because of this fear, because of this fear. Well, and, and, and I also don't think that's any different than any other moment in time throughout all of history when you're dealing with downward pressure and price. We always want a bottoming formation. We, we always want one. Sometimes I'm not, not as patient. By the dip. We do not buy the dip. Yeah, some of us buy the dip more, but not this time not for me. I am that. not I am no, not being cavalier. Right. Buying the dip is it, it, okay. When you buy the dip and you're waiting for confirmation, that's not buying the dip, Mark. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're doing a structured technical that's not buying the dip. Buying the dip is just that, oh, price went down, let's buy. Um, no, like wait for structured patterns here. We're going to get massive opportunity coming from these low points. We are. Uh, do you agree with that, by the way? Yes, that okay. I do uh, believe with. Like, I think my base case sure, in yeah. my stocks at low points. My okay. base case in my head is that you could have multiple weeks of volatility. here. Now, I don't know that that's going to play out, but I'm open minded to yeah. the fact. Have the you know, philosophy this week. Anything can happen. You know, and, and, but but I think you get a bottoming formation in some that leads to uh, perhaps a very nice end of the year rally. And I think Listen, there's a if next week's podcast called slowing momentum, you know, we got what we wanted. Because yeah, I, mean, I think step. you might be dealing three weeks from now's podcast name. <laughs> Listen, that's but, but I don't know. Right. I don't care yeah. the path it takes. Like I, I, the patience is a position. If it takes. All right. Well, we are behind schedule because while the Fed dominated the tactical landscape moving forward, and it did, it warranted an extended discussion because it, um, it it's the stage for the coming weeks. Uh, do you want to make fun of the Sam roll, Matt? I was going to. <laughs> you have my permission. <laughs> All right. I, I just very quickly, okay, there's there's a couple economic indicators that is starting to come out in into the woodworks a little bit. And the SOM rule basically was mentioned this week during a question during the QA period of the press conference of the central bank. And ever since then, I have seen people who I know don't even know what this rule is, would talk about it on social media, like, oh my goodness, end of the world type scenario. Winner's coming! Um, guys, they've been saying that about the inverted yield curve for four years. Yeah, for four years, it, it, yeah. This is a fairly similar one. It, it's when people utilize macroeconomic indicators without cross-comparing like economic environments, it's nonsensical. And, and it's, quite frankly, extremely lazy. What the SOM rule basically states is that if labor goes up 0.5% from the low point over a 12-month period, that is an economic indicator, warning sign of a recession is happening. And Mark, over the last, I want to say since like 1960, this indicator has been successful in every recession since too. Now, Mark... I'm going to tell you right now, that might sound to, to the layman as really important data. Every recession sends too. Um, I can point to substantially more economic indicators that are more viable than that one because you see these things before every recession. <laughs> you, see, you see labor going up before every recession, but the rule is 0.5. So when it goes from points, uh, and, and that's where we're at right now. We went from, what, 3.7 to 4.3. So we've, we've triggered that rule. And there was a question that was asked to Powell, does this mean something to you? And it was one of the times in Powell that, that I had a lot of respect for Powell during the press conference because he looked at that, uh, that individual and he's like, just kind of, I know what was going on in his mind, Mark. He was like, you just Google that. You just Googled them. Yeah, my problem with people that are using the SAM rule, because it is like very in vogue right now, 
is nobody wants to make a call that a recession is coming, right? It, because that's, you look, that's why they do it. it like, because it's like, oh, do you see this indicator? It's pointing to some nasty stuff. That way they get credit if a recession comes. But they I'm don't willing get to bet that. of the people that are discussing this rule, Mark, they they probably have never heard of this rule up until Thursday of this week. Yeah, no, I like listen, it is it be careful about what you listen to out and, there. And I'm sorry, I am an old gambler. I'm an old gambler. Just because Tulsa hasn't covered on the ro road for four straight times does not mean that this time is like those others. Yeah, right? Things are compare listen, like economic environment. Listen, 2024 is not the financial crisis. It's not 1929. It's not dot com. It's not the 70s. It's 2024. Analyze the variables in front of you. You know, learn from history. But it's 2024, right? It's so stop cherry picking your indicators. And and that's what I felt. Well, honestly, if that question never gets asked, here's the thing: if that question never gets asked on Wednesday, Mark, does anybody talk about this the next 48 hours? Yeah. No, answer the question. No, they, of course not. Well, then it's not it's not a real conversation. It's engagement farming on social media is what it is. I know, but they, these people, they, they love it. You know, the last four times small caps did this, the return like, is like, okay, but what's the context of this time? I, I do cross right? comparison all the time, but you got to compare it against the current, the current environment. There's another indicator I want to speak about just very quickly, though, because I do think I, I, I personally put a little bit more credibility on it than I do in terms of what what the uh, what any magical indicator that somebody can have pointing to some contraction economic data in front of a hypothetical recession or not, and and it is one of it's an it's a macro indicator. It's more regarding currency analysis than anything, Mark, and it's it's the Japanese yen and the Bank of Japan. When the Bank of Japan raises rates, Mark, that is always an indicator to to the entire marketplace that something is wrong. They might not know what is wrong, but it's something is wrong because the Japanese don't raise rates. They've only tried to do it like three times in the last 40 years, Chucky. Since 1989, the Japanese have only attempted to raise rates just a handful of times. I can count them on one hand, bro. You had 1989 that you basically went from like 2.5% to 4.5%. Uh, Mark, when the Japanese raised interest rates in 1989, it triggered a lost decade. And I can't tell you how, how, how volatile that moment was. We're not just talking about a lost decade of economic wealth for the, for, for the country of Japan. We're talking about a lost decade of, of wealth for many Asian countries. It triggered multiple Asian currency crises. Um, the, the real estate market in Japan literally just fell through the absolute floor. It never recovered the top pricing of the index itself. Not 40 years later, it hasn't done that. That's how big of a deal. And in the 1980s, Mark, there were legitimate conversations regarding the, the Japanese yen overtaking the United States dollar as the number one reserve currency of the world. They oversaturated the market. When they raised interest rates, it collapsed the yen and, and forced money to come home. They waited a few years to try it again because they're like, ooh, that was, that was tough. We're, we're not going to do that again. In 2000, they went from 0% interest rate in 2000, Mark. Okay, so let's let's look at this chart, for uh, for example. In 2000, they went from 0% interest rates, okay? They went from 0 to 0.25. So they just raised up 0.25. Mark, it created massive chaos in the Japanese markets to the point where they literally said, my bad, and cut it to zero immediately following that and embraced what is known as modern monetary theory, Constant low interest rates stimulate the marketplace, stimulate inflation. They are the ones that started this entire modern monetary theory in 2000. The next time they tried to uh, raise rates was in 2006. 
And in 2006, Mark, they tried it again. They went from zero to 0.25 again. In 07, they went from 0.25 to 0.50 until they said, nope, we're going to cut again. This week, they went from zero to 0.25. The expectation was zero to 0.1. They went to 0.25. That sparked, and, and this has already been being discussed over the last few weeks, but that sparked a massive selling behavior in the Japan, in 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 the United States dollar, as buyers and demand came in aggressively on the Japanese yen as money was going home. This indicator, the Japanese yen and the Bank of Japan raising rates, has been an indicator that is that was triggered in 0607 in front of the subprime meltdown, triggered in 2000 2001 in front of the uh, the dot com meltdown and triggered in 1989, which we don't think about the 1990 recession very much, Mark, but the 1990 recession, 91 recession, is why George H.W. Bush did not become president and why Bill Clinton got two terms, quite frankly, which means it was a big, big deal. And every time the Japanese have raised rates, it has triggered some other concern out there. And when you're looking at the Japanese yen, well, let me let me take a step. And uh, what what are, what are your thoughts so far? No, and, and this is one of those areas where your expertise dwarfs mine by you know magnitude of lot. Uh, and so, like, I find these conversations just interesting. And so, like, I'm more of absorbing this uh, right now. The only thing I would say from a contrarian standpoint is there's no way that chart is not historically oversold. <laughs> right and so maybe you maybe you see some bottoming like something you know be on the lookout for that uh if, but if if the dollar is going to embrace a cutting cycle and japan's going to even think about sniffing a rate uh rate hike conversation do not think about bottoming formations on a currency pair it, it, okay it, fair get, enough get destroyed yeah fair enough so uh yeah no observe you know it's one thing on the you know worry uh bonfire right now you know well, but uh it's but again, these things are extremely important because it's not a matter of something. There's a reason I said what I did, Chucky. And because, uh, for example, when we're debating the United States, we're saying, all right, let's think about bottoming formations. Let's think, uh, right? Everything you just said, I agree with when it comes to the US equity market. When you're talking about the Japanese yen and the currency market, it is not the same. It, it, no, no, no. It's two plus two equals four dash 1.6851. It is a vastly different skill set. It's a vastly different conversation. See, when the what the Bank of Japan did this week, they knew what was going to happen. The yen is the number one currency trade in the in the, in the carry trade. Number one, when when you have the Bank of Japan at zero interest rates and the United States at five point two five percent interest rate, you can buy the dollar. Okay, you can buy the dollar. And in this environment where the dollar is going up, 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 not only do you make money on the ownership of the dollar itself, but you get paid the difference on a leverage side of the equation at 50 to 1 on the carry trade, which is the dollars at 5.25% and the yens at zero. So let's say hypothetically you're carrying a positive carry of, of three and a half, four percent Let's just hypothetically say that. Well, let's say you're carrying that positive. Well, if the yen's going to raise rates and the and the and the U.S. is going to lower rates, well, that evaporates the carry. And if we all know that, well, what that means is you have to dump the dollar. You have to dump the dollar and buy back the yen, and that shifts trillions of dollars from international markets into the country of Japan. And so this is not a good thing in any capacity not for the currency market. And if the currency market's going to be volatile, nothing, no market's going to not be volatile if the currency market is volatile. This is, the to me, what the Japanese did, is, did this week is far more important than what the Central Bank of the United States did this week, who, in essence, simply punted on the interest rate cut mark. In essence, we can debate the messaging and we can yell at Jay Powell about the messaging and we can put normalization of labor on his tombstone at this point. And historically, we can think about all the missteps Jay Powell has had. But the most important data that came into the market this week was the Bank of Japan raising rates. That is always a concerning data point, 100%. Now, does it mean that the markets are going to just spiral out of control? No, 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 no. 
What I'm suggesting is this is more important data than some of the other economic indicators that people are talking about, because this one actually does have a very, very substantial track record when it comes to triggering uh, currency volatility and currency volatility always creeps into commodity volatility, which will always creep into U.S. equity volatility. Yeah, no, the uh, fascinating conversation. So many moving pieces, Matt. Uh, we're going a little bit longer than we would have liked to. And much like market participants on Thursday and Friday, uh, we haven't even gotten to Apple and Amazon earnings and Meta and like AMD and like in the you know like the massive forty percent of the market capitalization of the S and P reporting this last week. Uh, <laughs> we're going to have more extended earnings conversations. Uh, one point I want to emphasize here is that earnings season been pretty decent. Give us some numbers. Give us some highlights from this week, Matt. Uh, very quickly on the earnings side of the equation, it, it, it was an amazing thing when the economy and the Fed take the stage, everything else becomes secondary. One thing I want, I, I just want us all to keep an eye on is the concern on the earnings side of the equation is slowing growth. Does that equate to drop of guidance from Q2 to Q3? We'll have to wait to see that one. But as of right now, Mark, the earnings landscape has actually been a fairly decent one. Um, yeah, we're complaining in the market because we're spoiled little brats and we're not getting increases in guidance this quarter. But in general, blended growth has quietly been increasing all quarter long. Went from 9.8% last week up to 11.5% this week. And so you've, you've seen constant increases in blended growth. Right now, we're getting about 78% uh, EPS beats, which is uh, right on par with the five-year average. We got right now about 59% uh, revenue beats, which is underneath the 69% revenue average. Revenue has been an issue the last couple of quarters. Um, one, one concerning data point, so one positive data point is the blended EPS growth. That does give me confidence, but, but that confidence is shaken just a tiny bit given the fact that the veracity of those earnings beats are only equating to about 4.5% right now versus the historical average in the 8.5%. So we're beating and we're growing, but we're not beating and growing at, at what we normally do historically, which would equate to some degree of concern on the slowing growth side of the equation. Slowing growth will certainly create some volatility in the market. We've seen that in the last three weeks because markets they don't wait for to get the actual data. If they get concerned now, they'll price that concern in now. So, so they're always front running these things. They're always pricing these things in. But as this market does stabilize, Mark, and as we move, uh, as we as we kind of get removed from the Fed a little bit from last week and the negative labor market numbers from last week, I'm willing to bet that first economic data point that comes out that is like, oh wait, wait, <laughs> maybe we're not economically dying here. Um, well, when that occurs, Mark, all of a sudden, I guarantee you, the market participants are going to be back on the earnings wasn't that bad. Yeah, no, I mean, you, you can see the headlines three, four, five weeks, however long they are, when market participants don't have anything to talk about other than the, oh, things aren't so bad. Let's maybe put in a floor. Let's see where we can go. And that's the technical conversation coupled with other things that I think can provide a wave of trading opportunities. Until then, Matt, as we await, and I think we will have that opportunity. I think you think that we'll have that opportunity. It looks like we both are inclined to look into maybe some of those uh, technology darlings when that opportunity happens. Uh, you know, you know, it's uh, waiting out this, you know, being a pro, being disciplined in the coming days, uh, waiting for that uh, opportunity to develop. Well, even even like on like some people are concerned on the labor side of the equation. I'm a little bit concerned on the labor side of the equation. I'm concerned on the on the Bank of Japan what they're doing. But Mark, these concerns, if if they're all right, we'll be talking about a recession in nine months from now, mm -hmm. right? But the market does not wait for that. We still have to traverse simply because the market's not having a recessionary conversation does not mean we will have a recession simply because the Bank of Japan raised rates does not mean we're going to have a recession tomorrow. We are going to have a recession again, Chucky. 
We are. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. I don't know if it's going to happen next year. I don't have if it's going to happen a year later. I don't know if we're going to look back six months from now and be like, yeah, you know, that that labor market data we were concerned about last, you know, uh, uh, July, August. Uh, yeah, that triggered a recession. It, the conver- I'm not trying to say the conversation not legitimate. It is a legitimate conversation, but it also doesn't mean it triggers tomorrow and it doesn't mean it's guaranteed to happen. We have to traverse that road. Patience is a position right now. We certainly think there's going to be bottoming formations. We certainly think coming out of this chaos is going to be opportunity. And so let's be patient during the volatility. Let's be patient during the chaos. But in the back of our minds, let's get ready to buy some quality stocks coming out of this volatility. And whether it's, you know, by the end of this week, we have a better opinion or the end of next week or a month from now, we're going to navigate, navigate that as a community together. Yeah, absolutely. Well said. Listen, it's been a fun podcast. Matt said, listen, you have a schedule. Your job is to keep me on schedule. I think I did okay. I mean, it's like raining in like, that you know. That day in labor and the bank of Japan. Uh, yeah, like on a, oh, on a week over. like this, trying to, it's like herding cats. There's so much me? going I, on. I could have gone on for five hours on this one. Like, I got a lot to say. Um yeah. Some of it would be redundant. And, and it's going to be very interesting. And one of the things, because one of the things we are doing right now, and if you're watching this on YouTube, then you will see that we are doing a daily tackle today. And mm-hmm. we are going to update the technicals and the storyline. And now we're going to update what Fed speakers say, because it's going to be interesting that, you know, market gave a punch, a lot of criticism out there. I know Goolsby on Friday already was like, hey, we should do something. Come on, what, what are we doing? Now, it's going to be interesting to see if there's a synchronized message, if that calms the market. Uh, but if it does not, Matt, inflation was transitory, wasn't it? <laughs> it was. It was. Uh, a couple uh, things. Yes, uh, Mark, uh, really enjoying the Tackle Today uh, email, the Tackle Today post. You can always get Tackle Today right there on our Tackle Trading website. If you click on Tackle Today, you can see all the Tackle the Days. Tackle the Day is basically, it, it is our, it's our way we communicate with our, our community every single day. We do a write-up of what's happening in the market. We do a video, uh, basically a, a, you know, mini halftime report, I would say, to make sure everybody in our community is updated on the market activity. Obviously, we do a much more expanded e- edition in the Trader's Lounge. Um, but uh, really enjoying the tackle today, and you can sign up for tackle today right there on the website. But uh, definitely, really like that daily email, the tackle today. Um, Mark, uh, my last uh, my last thought is re- uh, really, really, really simple. Um, we 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 need to update the tombstone, and uh, on the tombstone right now, uh, J Pal's tombstone, and hopefully down the road, many, many, many decades from now. But uh, we'll have inflation is transitory. We already know that's on the tombstone. But uh, j Powell, uh, congratulations as you now get a new accomplishment. Labor is normalizing. That is also yeah, listen, on your tombstone. Stop this crap now. Do not. If there are problems in the labor market, if there are, don't go eight months like you did with inflation is transitory. Do not die on that horse or it, Matt is right. You will go down in history as no, no, one no. of them. Not will. Like, yeah, will. He is. It's already on. No. It's on the tombstone. I'm not taking it off. Dude, if he did a well, Jay Powell's too stubborn. He's gonna stick No, it's it. not it's not just the fact that he's trying to describe normalization from an initial claims. Trying to normalize the last three years of these labor market numbers, Mark. And, and the revisions we've had to see and the nonsense we've had to see and the gaslighting we've had to see, they have revised six out of the last seven labor market numbers down. They have revised like 12 of the last 14 labor market numbers down. We cannot normalize how inaccurate the snapshot of the labor market is it, 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 outside of initial claims, outside of what he's trying to do from a gaslighting on the message side of the equation. We cannot normalize what has been going on in the labor market over the last couple of years. I thought it was a really, really bad look out of pal on, uh, on Wednesday. And he had some bad timing on the uh, data that came out, but uh, because of that bad timing, nobody forced him to be so confident on the labor is normalizing conversation, but 
the tombstone has inflation is transitory and labor is normalizing. Welcome to that, Jay Pal. Um, my final thoughts, uh, it, it was a tough week last week uh, as, uh, as a market participant, a lot of volatility, but it was also expected to have a lot of volatility. We talked a tremendous amount over the last couple of weeks in our tackle trading community about these last two weeks, not just navigating them as we were going through them together, but preparing our community for what is coming at them, talking about these issues in, in our Traders Lounge, in the Tackle Trading Newsletter, in the Traders Report, it, it, making sure our community was fully apprised that this week specifically was full of landmines, it was full of variables, and it was a stay away and, 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 and to wait for better analysis, a cleaner environment. Well, we're through this week. Now we got to talk about those bottoming formations. We have these conversations every single day in our traders lounge at Tackle Trading. We have this, we put our detailed analysis every single week into our Tackle Trading newsletter. We rank all the sectors from a bullish to a bearish perspective. And if you, when we talk about navigating this market together, it's making sure that you have all the information you need at your disposal so that you can apply your systems, your investing philosophy with confidence into the financial world. And that's what we do at Tackle Trading. We put the education before application so that you have confidence and we navigate these together as a community. And if you want to be a part of that, you can easily go over to tackletrading.com, sign up for a free 15 day trial of the Tackle Trading Pro membership, and you can get access to all of that. So hopefully we see you in the community and, uh, and if you're watching to, uh, us on uh, YouTube, make sure to give us a like and share. That's the best way to help uh, the podcast. It helps out with the Google algorithms and the visibility. And uh, last but certainly not least, uh, once again, I know it was a tough week. If you have any questions or you need to break something down or you need help analyzing your portfolio, if you're a pro member of Tackle Trading, you can always sign up for a 30-minute consultation with one of the Tackle Trading coaches and let us know if you need some help. We're here for you. And so if you need, reach out so we can help. With that said, I hope everybody have a wonderful, wonderful rest of your week. Mark, last thought. All right, listen, just have a fantastic week. Listen, I think we've provided pretty good guidance, a pretty good big backdrop of what's happening. Check out that tackle today on YouTube uh, every day. It's 10 minutes, covers everything. You, it's kind of a way to little mini segments stay on top of the stories that we outline. Uh, so check them out. They'll be posted every day.